Africans. I, I do want to acknowledge, however, that we're located on Treaty 6 territories and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First uh, Peoples of Canada, whose, uh, whose presence continues to uh, enrich our community. The session is being recorded for future use, so if you don't want your image used, uh, simply uh, uh, close the video. Our speaker today is Richard Boulay, who's a, uh, an, a gay Edmontonian who has a master's uh, in fine arts degree and is a uh, nationally exhibited um, artist working primarily in textiles and uh, drawing. He also lives with schizophrenia and works for Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, he has spoken primarily to university audiences about his journey uh, from mental ill health to wellness. And he describes his mindset as being uh, the glass is half full. He's going to talk about um, mental health and creativity. And Richard, uh, welcome. And uh, I'll turn the, the meeting over to you now. OK, thank you. Thank you for the land acknowledgment. Um, I really appreciate that, being on Treaty 6. It's a privilege. And I would also like to thank Liz Messiah, uh, who helped organize this talk and uh, provided me quite a bit of feedback. So I'll just begin then. I have a prepared script uh, that is not too long. And then I have a little bit of time to meander from slide to slide. So uh, let me just get my reading glasses on here. Of course. Okay, so here we go. Uh, here is a, cap, a happy couple of seniors. John Cage on the left was an American composer of experimental music that has its roots in classical music. Merce Cunningham is on the right. He was a modern dancer and choreographer. Cage and Cunningham were life partners. He was, um, Merce was as experimental in dance as Cage was in music. Both of these men have passed on. They have had long and successful careers that broke new creative grounds in the 20th century. And uh, Cage's music and writings are an influence on my art and my gay life and how I learned to live with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. All told, mine is a happy story and I am content with life on life's terms. Okay, where are we at? Mud Book was created by John Cage and Lois Long. This is the cover to the book. Uh, Mud Book, How to Make Pies and Cakes. It was first published in the 1950s. It is indeed what it claims to be. It is a book on how to make and play with mud. I was totally closeted in my teens and early 20s, but one day I discovered Cage. This was when uh, I was an architecture student. I found Cage so intriguing and, uh, and as, a refuge, as a refuge. Cage follows Eastern philosophy. So I uh, did some reading by Alan Watts and DT Suzuki on Zen back in my early 20s. I was developing a rich internal life uh, during this period, but not without problems. My mental health was not all it could be. And by the time I finished my architecture, I knew I wanted to be at, at least try to be a, an art school uh, student. Um, so even back in my early 20s, there's something called the prodromal phase, which is hard to diagnose as schizophrenia. And uh, once someone is diagnosed as schizophrenia, they can look back in the earlier years and see early warning signs. So I was showing early warning signs. I was turning to alcohol and marijuana as early as 16. I moved from my parents' home and lived in another city for, for university. My use of alcohol and marijuana increased significantly when I was in another city. I felt quite down on myself as an architecture student. I beat myself up quite a, bit, quite a lot as a closeted gay man in my early years. I made progress in coming out in art school uh, when I outed myself a couple of, to a couple of students, and it was a start. Art had helped 
to release me from some internalized homophobia. I finished my BFA and decided to be a career artist. Here is a child playing with clay. I lived in a small town from grade two to grade eight. There was a creek with clay banks uh, that was a short bicycle ride from my home. The creek was also an excellent place to watch eggs turn into tadpoles and tadpoles turn into frogs. I remember the start of same-sex attraction during grade five. I did not have any insight into why I felt this way. I did believe that these attractions were supposed to be wrong because I was aware that the worst thing a boy could be called in the schoolyard was a homo. So here's a page out of Mud Book. Cage was definitely a person who was young at heart. There is also a great deal of poetry in the obvious. Four cups of dirt and two cups of water will make good mud. Unless your dirt, unless your dirt is dusty, then you might need a bit more water. So this is this is mud book. It's just joyous fun with uh, you know the child and everyone. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 33. I lived in transitional mental health group homes for a year and a half. Eventually I moved into subsidized apartment in Edmonton. I still live there after 25 years. Most of my money comes from provincial disability payments. I have a good job these days and my art brings in some money. I see a psychologist and a psychiatrist regularly. I volunteer here and there now and then. My favorite paid job was to help out in the art classroom. And these days I really enjoy doing data entry and simple office jobs at the Canadian Mental Health Association. I've worked a number of jobs over the years from day labor to working in an art gallery. So lots of, lots of different experiences for an artist. These days I abstain completely from alcohol, marijuana and cigarettes. My interest in Zen evolved into a simple faith in some sort of creator. My schizophrenia is still active and will be for life. I have a few mental health coping skills that I have developed over the years. In hindsight, I can see periods in my 20s where I was experiencing early schizophrenia flare-ups, which is what I just mentioned before, the, the prodromal phase. So this is, uh, this is gouache and ink and pencil crayon. And uh, Nahib Mahfouz was an Egyptian writer who published uh, a book of dreams. So I illustrated about half of the dreams that he had described in his book. And this is dream number 30. So uh, uh, it looks like a fairly well-worn person there with... Uh, um, something ominous hanging up on top. Okay. Uh, I am making textile arts with a friend from the Canadian Mental Health Association, Edmonton. Her name is Marilyn Olson. We met in a peer support group for people who are neurodiverse. This is an image of one of our cross stitches. So just so everyone can make sure they can read it, it says fly lamb, fly, fly fawn, Oh, fly over the aspen, I'll, oh, the birch, the pine. A little boy can have three fa favorite colors, more if he wants, more. Old woman just smiles. And this is the textile that completes the cross stitch I just showed. Marilyn and I made nine pieces for our first collaboration. This art was displayed at McMullen Gallery at the University of, of Alberta Hospital. Marilyn and I are well into our second body of work. So there's, uh, there's, a neat, there's like a, a happy figure, a happy head that's needle felting and the rest is cross stitch, crochet and uh, quilting. This is called Brothers and Drag. It is my first textile with a queer content. The words, I need rage so I rage hope is a cross stitch. This was made before I met Marilyn. So there's actually, this is about me and my three brothers uh, in my family. I decided that we should all be little drag dolls together on one of the pieces. So here's a, a, a magnification and you can see the little doll with the yellow dress. The blue is uh, carded silk and uh, 
little crochet pants. Uh, and uh, the cross stitch, I need rage, so I rage hope. I use this text uh, now and then in, in different types of pieces because I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good fit for, for, for me these days. This is a uh, Marilyn and Richard text I'll, uh, titled A Wandering. Marilyn is a self-taught artist. I was suited to be at university for learning. I did complete my master's of fine art when I entered my forties and I had enough mental, when I had enough mental health stability under my belt. Much of Marilyn's skills were, were transferred from being a little girl as her mother taught her how to sew. And uh, Marilyn also took some sewing in high school, but her tailoring skills, her quilting skills, her crochet, all of that is completely self-taught. She's, she's quite an amazing figure. So this is the <clears throat> cross stitch for the uh, textile. Room four, exuberant notions only go so far. The wind around my eyelashes certainly helps. And there's a little airplane, airplane dropping little bombs, but you know, it's a cross stitch. So there's some comfort in there. Um, cross stitches and quilting and textiles in general really make a person feel like uh, that they, they are at home and well tended or maybe visiting their grandmother. Uh, and uh, I find that I can deal with serious issues uh, in my art and if they're in textiles, uh, uh, including cross stitches, it softens the message a bit. So it's a little bit less, uh, less intense, but the message still gets across. Uh, this is a cross stitch for my first year MFA. I always have a cross stitch going. It is my meditation. I find working in textiles quite soothing. So I lived in two mental health group homes, one in Regina and one in Edmonton. And at both group homes where I was being assessed to see if I could live independently after I was diagnosed, I was asked, do I feel safe? So the mental health group home worker asked, do I feel safe? Um, that's a very important word. It's, it's used a lot these days. It's used in the queer community especially when we're in an environment where we, we, we're not sure if we're gonna be accepted. And uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful word. Uh, do, to ask someone if they feel safe um, goes a long way to starting a very rewarding conversation <clears throat> with some intimate sharing. Here is a little watercolor I made shortly after I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I think the picture is a good stand in as an image for myself in grade five when I internalize the word homo. There is an innocence and some distress in this picture. I made this uh, uh, way back in the day when I was about uh, 33. So it's, it's probably the oldest piece in this presentation. And here's a simple picture of me quite stressed out. Uh, a little bit of electrical charges coming off, some, some capillaries and blood vessels. And yeah, it's just a person who's, who's stressed. But if you look closely, there's a little face in the torso with two eyes and a mouth. Uh, so there's some happiness there. I find that this particular drawing has a lot of psychological tension. I never really know what is going to emerge on the paper when I start to draw. It is very much made up by the seat of my pants. <clears throat> this is watercolor, uh, oil pastel, uh, pencil crayon, and charcoal. And uh, this was made as a, uh, uh, back in my early 40s when I was upgrading my BFA courses in preparation for going into grad school. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good drawing. I like it. Here I am now out of the closet and relaxed about my gay journey. I am enjoying a happy sleep under the light of the moon. I can see I have a congruent understanding of every stage I have been 
have gone through in my life. I am happy at 60. I feel the horizon is wide open for art making and I am enjoying a peace of mind that comes from simple pleasures. These next three slides are a book I made for the children of my friend, Chris. Uh, Chris and I met at art school and her boys at the time I made these books uh, were six, uh, uh, maybe nine and seven and uh, 10 and eight. So <clears throat> this is the front cover and you can see that on the right hand side, there's a big wave in the middle, there's an island and sort of compressed on the uh, left hand side is a, is a waterfall. So this is the front cover of the book and the book is on its side. And you'll see a little bit more clearly how the book is structured. You can see the pages. Um, my, my working practice when I was living in Montreal, uh, which was where I lived at, immediately after my BFA in Winnipeg, um, my, I was working full time in an art gallery. And uh, as far as my studio was concerned, I would do one watercolor a day after supper. And then when I had enough of them together, I would bind them into a book and send them off to Chris's kids. Chris came out and helped me sew this textile. Here's the back of the, tech, of the book. <clears throat> this photo was taken in nickel galleries at the University of Calgary. And all the uh, art in this uh, photo is mine. These books still exist uh, and the kids, well, they're adults now, they're in their forties. So they still have fond memories of, of these books. I came out of the closet a bit more in art school. No one in my family knew I was gay. By the end of my BFA, I was drinking as an on again, off again alcoholic and a, and a daily marijuana user. Regardless of all the freedom of an opportunity I had been surrounded with, I still had much internalized homophobia and my mental health was deteriorating. That was just the way, it, that was just the way I was. Chris and another woman, Anne, put in a great deal of effort to draw out of me, to draw me out of my protective shell. My boundaries were not that healthy. So this is a Conte drawing of me sitting with my friend, Anne and we're holding hands on the couch and she's trying to engage me in having a, uh, an intimate conversation. But back in art school, that was pretty well impossible. Um, the, the more my self-medication increased with, uh, the more my coming out journey became awkward and the more my mental health deteriorated. These issues seemed to alienate people. I was in a fog most of the time. I had hit a stall. It was not long before I had a strong enough psychotic break to warrant a psychiatric <clears throat> ward hospital stay for a couple of weeks. I was committed involuntarily. I told no one that I was having substantial religious delusions mixed in with my gay sexuality. I did not cooperate in the hospital that much, so I was stabilized and released. I was offered a follow-up care, but I said, no, thanks. I did not need therapy. My mental health plan was to smoke marijuana less and drink alcohol more. My friends were starting to get to be very bold in asking me when I was gonna come out of the closet. In the end, I abandoned my friends and moved to a different city looking for a geographic cure to find something that really had no, I had no realistic insight into. I moved from city to city, Winnipeg to Vancouver, to Calgary, to Regina. And that road trip, I was quite ill the vast majority of times. I was able to hold down a couple of jobs, but not long. This textile is part of my MFA thesis. Mama Maya Vampire is about one of the religious delusions I went through in Winnipeg. There is a hint of a narrative, but it is impenetrable. Uh, I actually went on a walk and uh, the walk is described from Hospital Jesus 1 down to Bread Jesus 5. 
And um, I actually phoned my mom after the walk and I asked her if I was a vampire and she said no. So I went on to a different delusion. Here is the cross stitch for that textile. You can just see it. Uh, you can uh, scratch and scratch and scratch. There it is. You can see it on the far right side, halfway up. My MFA thesis textile work was 11 of these banners, all with large text and then small cross stitches. Here's another piece from my MFA, Scream Like a Shot Deer. Uh, and a constant re-examination of the meaning of the system uh, is a reference, rather oblique reference to when someone is, is in psychosis, uh, there is a continual sort of trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And there's far too stimulus, too, far too much stimuli entering the system. And, and there's a lot of confusion about trying to continually re-examine an ever-shifting uh, series of, of uh, conclusions that the outside world is presenting to the person with the illness, if that made sense. So this is from my brother, David, the text. Uh, I didn't know what to say, what to do. I had anxiety and apprehension. Your behavior was unexplained and incomprehensible. I felt lost. I wanted to let you know wherever you were, we would look for you. Mom carried the weight of it. No matter what you said, what you did, or how it affected her, mom never wavered. She accepted it all. Eventually, we had a name for it, schizophrenia. Yeah, it's a tough one. So I'm going to read a little bit about what it was like to be in psychosis, moving from city to city. So I thought I would put up a happy picture of a bird as a counterpoint to what I'm going to read. Uh, in my Vancouver days, I ended up in the East Hastings neighborhood. I lived for about a week in the, in the homeless shelters until I could calm down enough to get on welfare and move into one of the many single room occupancy hotels that were there in the neighborhood. I was at my psychotic worst. <clears throat> my job prospects for employment in my chosen field equaled zero. I had, the, I had a pen and a pad of paper and I was drawing. Then, I, then there was Calgary and Regina and more of the same situation of living marginally and self-medicating with alcohol and marijuana while psychotic. I was quite reckless in outing myself in some of the rougher bars during this period of wandering from city to city. Um, uh, I, used, I also outed myself to family and friends or whoever else I had met. I had a great deal of anger that was pouring out of me at the time. Um, so uh, my family kind of kept their distance from me, except my mom, she would listen to me. Uh, and uh, um, that's just the way it worked. But uh, yeah, just going to bars and not really caring who knew I was gay and, and um, uh, I also outed myself to family and whoever else I met. I suppose the psychosis was strong enough to break down the walls of my internalized homophobia and Richard is gay came pouring out. This, pro this process was what it was. So even though it was quite uh, rough, um, it did get rid of the internalized homophobia uh, to the degree that I could out myself to my parents uh, to my family, but also to you know strangers, which was not necessarily the smartest thing to do. <clears throat> On a certain level, I was feeling more empowered. At least the gay genie was out of the bottle. I was also experiencing much grandiose ideation. Eventually, I checked myself into a Regina hospital by the encouragement of my mother uh, and I cooperated this time around. I was told my diagnosis on my last day in the hospital. After the hospital, I was finally talking about being gay in a calm, cool, and collected manner. 
it took a mental illness to be diagnosed to get me to this place in my gay journey. The stability and supports that the group homes offered and the medication I take uh, really calmed me down. I then entered a prolonged grieving period, which is in hindsight, uh, I think it was necessary and ultimately quite healthy. So I'm going to show a series of cross stitches that I'm working on right now. And uh, each of these, I'm gonna show you four and each of them have a crochet border by Marilyn. And I did the beading and the cross stitching. And all four of these textiles have the word queer in them. So this one is quite celebratory. I am the type of man who stitches the feet of queer angels down onto his soul, wrap it up, wrap it up tight. So I think the last two lines kind of, um, I think they form as a, a way to keep the first four lines uh, uh, not to be, you know, exuberant to the point where they become out of control. This piece is a little bit uh, sad in text. It says, this fellow found his mystery had a little too much sadness. There was never any moonlight, dry, dry, very dry as well. This is a type of queer story. But this is also very beautiful in its whimsical uh, beating and sewing buttons down and just playing around and having fun. And un, un, x, x, are just fun letters. And uh, um, so the sadness of the textile is in, uh, uh, put up against the, the playfulness of the rest of the textile. So this is one that I, I have finished uh, recently. And uh, it says uh, in big letters, the kid was killed by the vicious dog today. And in small letters, it says, I need the word queer in this cross stake, cross stitch, ladybug, wasp, daisy, thorn, chick, rattlesnake. So this is a return to uh, uh, my childhood and the internalized homophobia that I had to deal with. And eventually uh, I was swallowed up by by the internalized homophobia, but as you know from my story, that difficulty has been overcome. I'm happy and healthy these days. So this is still in its uh, paper phase. It's, uh, it's a schematic uh, on a eight and a half by 11 sheet of uh, printer paper. So in big letters, it's gonna say dark hair from soil. And in small letters, it's going to say, yes, many of his bids for queer salvation were reckless. So I think this is going to reference the, the uh, coming out of the closet in some of the, the, the less uh, safe places that I did when I was quite ill and moving around from city to city. And, This is just fun. It says in big letters, rata tat 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 tat. And in little letters, it says, a little girl and a little boy decided this morning to go on some adventures because this is such a curious life. And then uh, the um, beating down below was really a lot of fun to do. And, and uh, the crochet border is. Uh, this is the final slide and it says the search for perfect moonlight is not a waste of life and this i have to get give credit to uh, a pianist and composer that is around our age named chris miller who i met in winnipeg and he is now in toronto and uh, this is his word so I asked him if I could use them and turn them into a cross stitch and he said, fine. So in the end uh, of this presentation, there is something quite beautiful, something quite, quite um, introspective and it's worth the effort.
So if, if um, I leave anyone to uh, take a lesson from my story, it's uh, persevere, keep trying, uh, do the best you can, and uh, hopefully uh, things will work out as far as a gay life is concerned. So that's it. Richard, thank you for a, uh, a wonderful talk. It's a, a privilege to have observed your art and the progress and to hear the explanations that you, uh, you give. There are some parts that perhaps baffled me. There are other parts that I could relate to so closely. It's, uh, it's a journey that I suspect all of us found. found pieces of in our own journey. And uh, I, uh, you are ha happy to take questions, I take it, uh, Richard, and I am uh, going to open it up and I see Michael's uh, uh, hand. So Michael, I'll ask you first. Uh, yes, uh, and, and thank you, Richard. Um, uh, but was uh, the the story and the the work that you've done in terms of uh, your art? It's amazing. Um, your cross stitching and the rest is really quite remarkable. Um, you you mentioned along the way a couple of different times um, a number of a, a particular a couple of particular women that helped you, or whether it was with the stitching or whatever. I, I'm curious whether whether there's been any men that you found helpful. Um. Yes, uh, my brother David, who is one year older than me, uh -huh. um, we, uh, he uh, actually found me in Calgary. Uh, he left Toronto to, to search for me. And uh, he tried to help me, but, it, but uh, it didn't work out. But over the years, uh, he's heard my whole story. And uh -huh. he's actually the person who's allowed in the, to talk to my psychiatrist and psychologist uh, in uh, uh, if he sees anything wrong. Yep. Um, other, another person I want to meet, uh, mention is uh, an old professor I had when I was doing my BFA. His name was Don Reichardt, and I had him for first, second, and third year, and fourth year painting. And uh, he really took me from an uptight arts, uh, architecture student and really loosened me up into someone who could uh, um, work work with a less work with a more uh, poetic language, uh, like a lot of free form collage, uh, mm. things like that. So my old professor. Um, there's lots of men that have helped me out over yeah. the years, uh, as there are women, but. In, so then that, if I can, a second question, um, particularly since you mentioned about the, the art, some of the earlier work and, and uh, that you described and showed was um, uh, painting, watercolor, etc. Um, have you kind of left that and done mostly stitching now or you do both still? I, I do both. Uh, uh -huh. the, the majority of my time is spent cross stitching because it takes so long to, to make a cross stitch. Yeah. Um, the one I showed you on uh, uh, the kid was killed by the vicious dog today. That took uh, five months to make. Uh -huh. But um, if I can't focus on the cross stitching or the sewing, <clears throat> I'll turn to drawing and uh, drawing or watercolor. And works on paper are a very good way to get a lot of pent up anxiety and uh, uh, out of my system. Good. So drawing is an important part of my yeah. art practice. Okay, okay. good. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. And again, um, uh, very interesting. And, and uh, much of the work that you've shown is really quite remarkable. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Are there other uh, questions? People, I had a question, Richard. Is the... The art is really a form of a positive form of self-medication as opposed to the destructive self-medication uh, that uh, you had done before with substance abuse. Is oh, that a fair summary or is it a total misapprehension? Uh, 
That's an excellent insight. I never thought of it before that way, but I can see that that's, that would be a, a truth uh, to my art practice. The, the stitching and the drawing has replaced the alcohol and the marijuana. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll think about that for a while. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, it is quite accurate. <laughs> Joan. Hi, Richard. Uh, that was really awesome. Uh, I love the textiles. Um, I'm just wondering about your creative process. Um, did you do any journaling so much uh, during these years? Because you seem to have some nice uh, written words about each item that you've produced. Like, did you kind of continue? Do you write much, I guess is my question. Uh, not really. Um, if I write, I write to my brother David and to my uh, psychiatrist. Uh, my visits with my psychiatrist are only about five or 10 minutes long because he's such a busy fellow. And uh, sometimes I will write about what's going on in my life that uh, in a one page uh, document so that he can summarize, he can read and summarize quickly. And then I send it to my brother David and uh, Liz Messiah is actually my psychologist. So uh, she, uh, she's involved in my writing as well, but it's either for therapy or it's for uh, just the text for uh, cross-stitching. Right, okay, thanks. I think Ace has his, his finger up. Uh, this topic is a very, very important topic. And the fact that you were able to do, use your artwork and creativity to struggle through some of the things you were going through with your mental health. Um, my family, there is bipolar and schizophrenic people in my family. And I have PTSD from child abuse and severe anxiety and severe depression. Uh, there's times where I won't leave the house unless it's with somebody else. Uh, but I did find a place called Prosper Place, and I was really afraid to be out there as a transgender man. But there are people being able to be out and were accepted by the other people there. And we do creative things. So I find that when I do some creative stuff, um, that it does alleviate my depression. And so I, I really like that that worked for you, too. That's amazing, Ace. Uh, that is, that is, uh, thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. Um, I'm sorry that you have the difficulties that you deal with, but you have a place like Prosper Place. Yeah. And uh, um, I may see you next week as well because I'm giving this talk as part of their one day conference. Um, I know Colin Simpson. He used, I met Colin Simpson when he, we were, he was working at the Schizophrenia Society and yeah. I was a volunteer. So that's, that was many, many years ago. I, I don't know if I'll attend in person. That's very stressful for me, but I wish that they had more Zoom type things there, but they don't at the moment. Okay. But it's, it's, your presentation today is a presentation you're giving up cross your place, right? Yeah, it'll be the same thing. Okay. Well, yeah. I'm glad I was able to, to hear your presentation then. Yeah, great. Well, keep yourself safe and 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 uh, healthy. And, Thank you. Uh, keep talking. Keep talking, and if you take meds, keep taking your meds, mm -hmm. and enjoy life as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ace. Uh, uh, is there uh, anyone else who would like to uh, make Dawn? Thank you. Richard, your talk was incredible. Um, and I picked up my pills yesterday, so yay me. Um, so important to keep, take care of ourselves. Um, so we haven't met yet, Richard, but I'm the ED of the Pride Center, Edmonton. Um, and I, I, I have a couple questions. One is, um, do you teach art classes? Uh, hint, hint. <laughs> um, 
because I think it would be wonderful to have some kind of artistic um, uh, practice um, within the Pride Center that is um, that is just free flowing um, as you, as your art is. Um, and uh, I guess my second question is, you know, having gone through the experience of of coming to terms with your own identity, coming out in different ways over uh, many years in different ways, uh, what is your advice to um, to young people who may be experiencing those early stages of schizophrenia? Because we know that with um, prolonged marijuana use in young people 25 or younger, that schizophrenia is more most likely going to appear um, in those early uh, stages. So what would your advice be as, um, as a creative, as an artist, as someone who has gone through their youth, um, navigating their queerness, and navigating their mental health with a, having a, such a stigmatized mental health condition? Um, I think, again, it comes down to whether or not the, the, the uh, younger person feels safe. Uh, if, they're, if they need someone to talk to um, because they're going through a difficult time, um, they can phone the distress line. And uh, uh, um, if they have, you know, the way Chris and Anne helped me in art school when I was so struggling with the early symptoms of schizophrenia and, and uh, trying to come out of the closet, as well as my professor, Don, they, 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 they established a very beautiful, non-threatening friendship with me. And, and I learned to trust them, even though I, I knew I was, I shouldn't have been smoking so much marijuana. I shouldn't have been drinking so much alcohol. But over the years, you know, um, those friendships paid off in the long term, but um, at the time, early symptoms are, are very difficult to, to, to diagnose as schizophrenia because quite often there's not a psychosis if, if, I've, if I'm up on the science of it. Um, but there is unusual behaviors. Um, I, th I think uh, any, any one person needs a confidant of some sort that they can talk to. And, um, oh gosh, it, it, building, building a trusting relationship. You know, I used to, I used to uh, work at the Bissell Center as a junior mental health advocate. And there was one individual there who had schizophrenia. And this individual was living in the, uh, River Valley. <clears throat> and he was taking his pills because they were taking the, their pills because we had them at the Bissell Center and he trusted the Bissell Center, the people at the Bissell. No one took advantage of him. People were always welcoming. People smiled and said hello, um, just human to human gracefulness really and respect and you know he, this person was offered support periodically for getting into one of the housing first initiatives but the schizophrenia was at a point where this person wasn't they were interested in going into housing but not until they received an apology from the police or the queen of england and so the, the schizophrenia was active to the degree that they were living marginally and in a bit of a pickle. 
but because they were not a danger to themselves or others, apparently living in the river valley isn't considered a danger to oneself. I, I, I would beg to differ on that one. But I don't know, like if, if the Pride Center also wants someone from the mental health crisis team to, to come in and give a talk, I know there's a certain amount of, of uh, visits that I have received and uh, over the years too. And uh, the crisis team is usually uh, a mental health worker and a police officer. And the police officer is necessary in case the individual is under uh, a danger to themselves and they need to be taken to um, a facility where they can be closely monitored. But I have witnessed that that is still, should be a very respectful conversation to have. But yeah, just build a friendship and, and treat this person beautifully. That's good advice. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Okay, and I'll, I've got an email uh, I have your email, Don. So I'll I'll follow up with you on the teaching. Uh, there's some there's some things in in development right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's see, Jan. Hi, Richard. I I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to compliment you on the choice of colors that you used for your um, artworks, your cross stitch. I found the colors that you chose very soothing, very calming, uh, very pastels, very, uh, you know, it made me feel good to look at your artwork. I just want to extend that compliment. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I, I think that's a lot of influence from uh, the expressive art circles in Edmonton. Uh, which is what the new name for art therapy. But we had an expressive arts uh, instructor working at CMHA for a while. And she always started uh, her lesson with a check-in and then a very gentle exercise uh, that a, and then a check-out to make sure everyone was okay. But um, yeah, it's, I'm, if I need... Uh, I love color. I love celebrating art. I love celebrating color in art. Yeah. I wondered, in a, as a, almost idle curiosity, but why of the many gay artists did you choose John Cage and Merce Cunningham uh, to open your talk? Is there something that I missed there? Well, I have a, a picture of John Cage on my, foot, my wall right over there. Uh, <laughs> He's a bit of a hero to me. Uh, I see. <clears throat> I actually wrote him a fan letter once, but he didn't reply. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I stumbled onto Cage through knowing a music student. And I stumbled onto Verez and Stockhausen and Schoenberg and all of that. But um, Cage was special. I had his books. Um, he, uh, I, and I would read them and the it's just beautiful concrete poetry that allowed me to have space where I could I didn't have to challenge myself in the sense that <clears throat> I didn't feel threatened by him there was lots of space in his in his writing where I could I could uh, I could enter and, and feel safe hmm. well, thank you thank you I uh, that's uh... I'm just looking at our time. I see we're getting close to uh, uh, the hour. So unless if anyone, this is the final opportunity for a final question or comment. Uh, seeing none, uh, I, uh, Richard, I, I don't know what to say other than thank you. Uh, you're, your art, your courage in, in delineating your journey with complete candor and honesty humbles me. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. Thanks, Larry. And 
I uh, thank you for for having me at this this talk. Um, I've been in Edmonton for quite a few years. I used to volunteer at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center when it was called that down on a 124th Street. Um, but I I uh, I ended up just hanging around mental health circles and and then Liz has encouraged me to get more involved in the gay community again. So this is like uh, my second introduction to the gay community. So I, I'll be hanging out a little bit more with, with uh, Don. I'm sure you and I can have a talk. We'll go from there. We're, we're delighted to have met you. Thank you. And I'm quite sure I can speak for everyone on, in, that, uh, in that way. So I am going to, uh, to wrap up um, the, uh, the meeting and uh, remind you that next week will be a, um, a talk that I will be informative, but I suspect rather less impacting uh, at a personal level in um, uh, Laurel Whittingham from SAGE is going to talk about SAGE's programs and services uh, for seniors, sometimes as GLBTQ2S plus people, we tend to forget that there we have lots of the same issues and needs that the whole community does. And we, and unless it's something labeled specifically for us, we often forget that we're included in the bigger group as well, at least I, I think increasing that that is the case. I'm so Laurel Whittingham, same time next week. Uh, Jan will um, will uh, moderate that session, and let me remind you again uh, that we will send an evaluation questionnaire out to you, and that uh, that your opinions really are crucial to us in planning uh, uh, future meetings. Uh, and remind you finally that you can contact us through Aging with Pride at Pride Center of Edmonton.ca. And I'm now going to return the meeting with further thanks to Richard and to uh, Dawn, who is standing in for, um, for Kim Marie and our usual technical person who is uh, away sick. So thank you all for, for being here. Thanks. On over to you. Thank you everyone for attending this joint presentation. Um, it is just wonderful every time we have it. I just get newly inspired um, every time, not only by the speaker who comes, but just by the conversations that we have afterwards. So thank you all again for coming, for supporting this program. John, would you mention the debriefing as well, which I forgot to do? Absolutely. So um, usually after Aging with Pride, um, the core team, well, actually everybody just logs off and the core team and the speaker logs back in. So Richard, if I can get you to log back off and then back into the session, and then you can speak with me, Larry and Jan just for some final notes. And everyone else, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next week. Okay, great. Bye for now. See you in a second. Bye. Bye, all. Bye bye.